You're listening to Let's Talk Creation. And welcome back to another uh, fun episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And Paul, this this episode, we've got a really interesting subject. It's been a kind of a, kind of a touchy subject with some people. <clears throat> no, it's not feathered dinosaurs. No, it's not fossil ape men. This time we're dealing with um, horse fossils. Uh, so, Paul, you might remember the horse fossil series. I'm sure you've seen it at museums um, many times. I know I have. Um, yeah. I don't think I've seen it recently. Um, museums have been uh, changing things around because the horse story got a bit more complicated. Um, mm. But uh, this episode is inspired by a presentation that was given at Origins uh, this past summer. Origins is the uh, annual conference of the Creation Biology Society, the Creation Geology Society, and the Creation Theology Society. Uh, we jointly meet every year, and I am a past president of the Creation Biology Society. I'm just sort of a, I guess I'm a board member now, and I kind of cheerlead as much as I can, um, do little odd tasks. But anyway, uh, this uh this year we had a new presentation on uh, horses and it's good because it's been a while since we looked at them. So, so our guest, our special guest for this episode is Dr. Tim Brophy. Tim, welcome. Hey guys. Hey Todd. Hey Paul. Good to see you both again. Good to see you, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have you here. Uh, Dr. Brophy is a professor at Liberty university. He is the new director of the Center for Creation Studies. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your uh, your center there? Sure. So like you said, I, I am Tim Brophy. Um, you know, I, I'm a biologist by training, uh, grad degrees in biology, uh, environmental science. I also interestingly have a seminary degree as well. I planted a church 15 years ago and pastored for that long. I recently passed that torch to new leadership. Um, so I sort of have a interesting mix of training. Uh, I am, as you've said, I took over for Dr. Marcus Ross as director of the Center for Creation Studies at Liberty. Uh, the center has been around since 1985. Uh, since the very beginning of Liberty University in 1971, they've held to a young earth uh, creationist position Dr. Jerry Falwell Sr., the founder, was heavily influenced by the Genesis Flood uh, book, Henry Morris, and he, he came around to seeing young earth creationism as the best interpretation of the scriptures. And uh, so from the beginning, we've had creationism uh, taught in science classes, Bible classes, theology classes. Around the, the 80s, though, they were getting a lot of pressure from their accreditors about that kind of a thing. And so they, they saw fit to create the Center for Creation Studies, uh, the class uh, History of Life, CRST 290, has been around uh, since uh, 1985. Uh, we've added uh, a course, an advanced course. We have a minor now, which includes courses from the Divinity School courses in our sciences. We host speakers. Um, we do research. So we do lots, lots of things to promote the young earth position. Great. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, right. listeners and audience members may not know Tim and I were students together Yep. in the biology department. <laughs> I think we probably first met in 1990 or 91. I was trying to piece that together. Yeah, it would have been close to that. Yeah. I was actually, uh, Michelle and I, my wife, were students here together, and we were both museum docents in the uh, Creation Museum back, back in those days. So I started off doing my community service 
uh, giving people tours of the Creation Museum. Right. So it's pretty gratifying to be back and, and doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. Well, today's That's conversation great. is going to be not exactly an interview. Um, every <laughs> one of us here has examined horse fossils at one time or another in our careers and um, written on them. Paul, I think you've done a, you did a, a little study of uh, what we might call the early horse fossils, the, the Eocene forms. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I did a couple of studies as a kind of follow up to the work that you did uh, back oh, in, right. that was published back in 2003 and of course, uh, Tim this year at Origins was presenting on the work that he's doing, which is you know a whole new generation of work on the horse fossils. So yeah, so we've we've all kind of worked on this at one time or another. Right. So I thought we would kind of interview each other instead of just interviewing Tim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I thought I'd kick it off by uh, helping people, uh, people in the audience to uh, understand what we're talking about when we talk about the horse series. So the year that this started was 1875, 1876, about that time. Darwin's Bulldog. You might remember um, a guy named T.H. Huxley, who went by the nickname Darwin's Bulldog. Uh, he was visiting... The United States at that time, and at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, I believe it was Othniel Marsh who brought out these these yeah. horse fossils that he had been collecting out west. Um, yeah, that's correct. It was Othniel yeah, C. Marsh. It was yeah. Othniel Marsh. Okay, and so, uh, so this is. This is what, 25, 26 years after origin. No, no, 16 years. Math is hard. 16 years. It's it's very <laughs> soon after origin was published, right? 1859 to 1876, so 17 years maybe. Um, and so Marsh seized on this as an excellent example of evolution. And so he had prepared a, a diagram lining up these these this this number of fossils that he'd found uh, and showing what he argued was the evolution of the modern form of the horse um, and you guys know what horses look like donkeys zebras they're all pretty similar uh, on the outside and um, and they're large right they're big animals and the the evolution of the horse uh, that Huxley devised uh, from the fossils showed this gradual transition from a creature with multiple toes all the way to a, the horse with its big central uh, sole lone toe, right? The big hoof of the horse. And then you could also see it growing in size from a thing that was literally barely knee high. Um, that I believe was called Aohippus at the time. We call it Hierakitherium now. Um, all the way up to uh, the you know the big giant horses that we have today. And then there was changes also in the teeth. And this is one that we scientists like to talk about, but I don't think the public really uh, grabs onto this too much. But it goes from these sort of really sort of low bumpy teeth that you would find in an animal that sort of great that browses on um, leaves and bushes uh, to this really tall, flat, grinding teeth of the horse, which mostly eats grass and grazes. So that was the horse series. And you can find creationist objections to the horse series all the way back to 1876. <laughs> so... This was this is an old argument that's been going on for a very long time, um, and yeah, through the through the through the creationist the early creationists of you know pre nineteen fifty, uh, through the Genesis flood into the sixties and seventies and eighties, you can still find creationists arguing that that the the evolution of the horse is not real, 
and that the fossils don't really show what Huxley said they showed. And you can find scientists producing better diagrams and all that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, so that's that's kind of where we are now. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting about that, Todd, is that they're horses all the way up. It's horses all the way through. It's not like we've got horses evolving from non-horse. It's just it's horses from the Eocene upward. So it's strange that creationists would have taken this antagonistic position uh, throughout the history of its study. That's always yeah, yeah. That's always been interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's because it became such an evolutionary icon, didn't it? And so it just attracted criticism, perhaps. Uh, yeah, perhaps in an unthinking kind of way, it was just a knee jerk reaction. You know, this is evidence for evolution, and so we've got got to kind of knock it down. Yeah. And um, but it but it's been such an iconic image, hasn't it? That kind of straight line yeah. diagram showing the evolution of the horse. Actually, uh, back in eighteen seventy six. Um, I think I'm right in saying that Marsh didn't actually draw the uh, the the various horses to scale, so you didn't actually see the trend in size, oh, okay. but you did see some of the other trends. I, th I think the trend in size, um, the first person who kind of then sort of drew it to scale and did it that way was a paleontologist called William Matthew in a, in about 1902, um, and so that's where you kind of get this size trend. Okay, um, and of course. You know, we, we we know now that that straight line sort of unidirectional linear change is a gross oversimplification and that the horse uh, series is actually much more complex. And you, you see it now sort of portrayed as this kind of bush bushy tree rather than this sort of straight line evolution, this sort of orthogenesis kind of idea. Right. Um, but it's yeah, it's become such an evolutionary icon that it's just there to be knocked down, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of that's just based on fear. Instead of dealing with what we see in front of us and, and dealing with the data, it's sort of like we're afraid to give the evolutionists even you know just an inch, fearing that they're going to take a mile. Um, but I think we need to just take it head on and, and deal with what we see in the data. Yeah. So you guys... You guys are kind of, uh, you sound sympathetic to the horse series, <laughs> almost. You want to, you're, you're, you're kind of jumping to the conclusion of, of, of what we found here. So can, can you, uh, can someone help me understand? Uh, are we saying that horses evolve from little animals, little knee-high creatures? Is that what you want to, want me to believe? Well, maybe it would help if we kind of explain for those who are, you know, maybe not familiar with it, what the horse series actually is. Um, okay. Uh, you know, so so why why don't we kind of go through the horse series and then details of the animals? Come, you mean? Then yeah, details of the animals, and then we can kind of come back to answer that question and all right, uh, fine. <laughs> see what we make of it. So, so the 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 horse series basically is uh, a series of fossils that are found in rocks of the Cenozoic. Uh, the, the oldest horse fossils show up in uh, lower Eocene rocks, which uh, according to conventional dating are about 56 million years, so, something of that order. And uh, the first horse fossil, the, the, the animal at the base of the horse series, is this little thing that you've already referred to called Hyracotherium. Uh, it's quite a small animal. It's, it's only about two, two and a half feet long. Um, it has four toes on it on its front foot, uh, three on the rear. And it was probably a kind of forest dwelling animal that browsed on leaves and foliage. You know, it's, it's got these low crowned teeth for, for browsing. Uh, so that's the animal at the base of the series. And then if you go a bit higher in the sequence of rock layers uh, in the Oligocene, which is about 33 million years ago, according to conventional radiometric dates, uh, we have this animal, again, quite small. It's about the size of a sheep called Mesohippus. And Mesohippus has three toes on its front foot, but like Hyracotherium, it also has these low-crowned teeth for, for browsing on, on foliage. And then if you, you kind of go up a bit higher in the 
uh, rock series, um, we have an animal in the Miocene layers. So that's about sort of uh, 23 million years ago uh, in conventional dates. And that's an animal that's a, a bit bigger. Um, it has uh, three toes, but the central toe is the toe that bears most of the animal's weight. So there's a kind of reduction in importance of the side toes. Uh, this is a creature called Merikippus. Uh, and it also has different teeth. This is quite interesting because it, this animal, instead of having the browsing teeth of the, the earlier animals in the series, it has high crowned teeth with a much more complex sort of grinding surface uh, that appears to be more designed for uh, grazing, grazing, grass eating rather than browsing on foliage. And then if we go a bit higher still in, in the sequence, we in the upper Miocene to Pliocene, we have a an animal called Pliohippus. Uh, this is a much larger animal. It's about uh, four feet tall. And Pliohippus is really interesting because when we look at individuals of Pliohippus, we find that some of them have three toes and some of them just have a single hoof with vestigial side toes. So the side toes are very reduced, uh, but they're, they're all Pliohippus. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. And they also have grazing teeth. They have these high crowned teeth. And then, of course, at the top of the sequence, we have our modern horse, uh, which belongs to a genus called Equus, uh, which has the single toe that you mentioned, the single hoof, and has high crown grazing teeth. So we have this series of fossils um, through the Cenozoic rock layers that seem to show a kind of overall increase in body size, uh, a reduction and loss of side toes, and uh, this change in the height of the teeth and the complexity of the the, the the chewing surface of the teeth so we get these these trends and as i say it's it's much more complex than that but that's kind of the simple straight line kind of diagram that that many people will have seen so that that's basically the horse series that's what we're talking about here yeah and of course there are lots of new names um most recently i, I think that hyracotherium sandre which is sort of the original horsey hyracotherium is now been put into the genus Sifripis, S I F R. Oh, yes. And of course, the, the only Hyracotherium now is the non equid Hyracotherium leporinum. And there's mm -hmm. only one true Eohippus now, Eohippus angustidens. So, you know, all of these new names are being introduced. So we'll sort that out in uh, some of the yeah. things we're writing uh, coming up. So this series is basically a 50 million year, if you buy that, 50 million years of, of change from this little horsey thing to the big horses that we have now. Um, and yes, you can pick out, as you did, Mesohippus and Merikippus and so forth, and you can show there's generally this sort of linear trend. Um, and you also mentioned that sort of the, the, the general mode of understanding it now is more like a um a bush right so that it's um and that comes from the the many 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 others that we haven't even named hipparions yeah. and neohipparions and pseudoparions and so forth uh on and but, on it goes yeah there it is <laughs> so it, it kind of looks more like that rather yeah. than uh the older diagrams, they're more like that. Okay, yeah. so kind of linear series exactly. of taxa, but now it's portrayed as this kind of very complex sort of branching bush or yeah. tree. Yeah. Right. Okay, so Paul, you mentioned um, my paper from two thousand three. Yeah. Should I should I describe what I did there? What we did there? Yeah, that would be good, I think. Yeah, I think we can start there. So so this was, so for those of you uh, longtime listeners, you might remember we've talked before about barominology um, and using uh, information about the fossils in order to try to discern what created kinds are. Um, we will definitely put links to past episodes in the show notes in case you want to 
uh, brush up on what we've said before about baromenology. But this, this sort of set the stage here. This was sort of the wild frontier of the earliest days of baromenology. There had been almost nothing published uh, along the lines of the sorts of methods that I would sort of settle into as the as the new millennium uh, went on. Uh, and certainly not to the level of sophistication that we do things today. So it's it's all it's all sort of rough and messy. So but it started out with uh, uh, a friend named David Cavanaugh who is who said we should do this this thing where we calculate correlations uh, between taxa and we can do it based on characteristics that are compiled and published about various horses, right? And so maybe we can say something interesting about the horse series. And that's kind of always been something I've been interested in in baromenology is, well, what do you do with these, these prominent examples of evolution, right? So what do you do with the horses? What do you do with things called mammal-like reptiles that are supposed to show evolution of mammals from reptiles? What do you do with the the four-legged fish you find in the Devonian, uh, that sort of stuff. So the idea of doing it on horses really appealed to me, and we just happened to find this paper that had these characteristics of the horses. I think there were 30 of them, or 33, something like that. Not very many. And 33 characters and 19 taxa. There you go. 33 characters, 19 taxa. Every one of them was a horse. So yep. we were not going to be able to test whether the horses were their own created kind because all we had were horses. Um, and we did our analysis and we sort of said, well, it looks to us, and we wrote this, this impenetrable title, the hor fossil equity is a, what did we call it? A, a monobaromen or stratomorphic. Yeah, a monobaromenic stratomorphic series. Yeah. So what is that supposed to mean? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it basically meant that we we believe that all, based on our analysis, that all horses belong to a single created kind. And that that, and the, the real surprising thing was when we did sort of a multidimensional analysis on it, we found that the, the form of the horses seemed to line up pretty well with the order of the fossil record, which was not something I really thought would happen going into this. It wasn't anything that I was looking for. So that really stuck out to us. And so that's the stratomorphic part, right? It's it's a series in the sense that the form of the horse really matches up pretty well with the order of appearance in the fossil record. And I think we should we, yeah. we should mention here that the part of the fossil record where we find these horses we think is post flood right so if we if we've identified where the end of the flood is in the fossil record um correctly uh, and i think those of us here think that you know it's around the end of the cretaceous it's around you know the transition between the mesozoic and the cenozoic then these horse fossils are in post flood sedimentary layers so the, whatever this series means whatever it, you know however we interpret it we think the context is what's happening after Noah's flood. Right. Right. Which has huge implications for rate of change, right? Intrabaraminic diversification in the post flood world. I mean, that's really where the rubber meets the road. And that's why this is an important uh, topic, an important series to study. Yeah. So, to, to sort so of, what do you mean by intrabaraminic yeah, diversification? <laughs> <laughs> well, if if there were two horses that came off of the ark and we go all the way from Sifrahippus all the way up now through Equus, and even if it's branching and it's bushy, all of that diversification from little browsing horses with browsing teeth to, uh, you know, with three toes up through big horses with uh, molar teeth for grinding grasses and uh, a single hoof, all of that change has happened since the end of the flood, since those horses came off of the ark. So 
that's something for us to deal with and wrestle with in terms of, um, you know, what does that mean? And is that something we see in other groups as well? Right. Yeah. And that's kind of a big deal. That is a big deal. Yeah. I mean, that's a, for, for, I think for creationists who like to default to God made every, God made every individual thing that I see, zebras and donkeys and uh, horses all directly, um, to say that they all came from this massive burst of change. That's that's a hard pill to swallow, I think, maybe for some folks. So. Now, one part of the story that I've always found really interesting <clears throat> is the correlation between the morphological changes and what was happening in the landscape. So if we sort of focus on North America, especially happening yeah. in the landscape of North America, going from more of a forested um you know, landscape to being more open grasslands, certainly in the, the prairies of, of the American uh, West, uh, that there's a pretty tight correlation there as well. Yeah. Bigger horses that can run now that are eating grasses uh, instead of, you know, little horses with, with uh, browsing teeth uh, walking around, running around in forests. So I think that's an important yeah. part of the story as well. Yeah. It sort of, it sort of makes sense. Yeah, because if we think about that that post flood context, we've got a world that's basically dry drying out. Right. We've got a world that is cooling down over time. Uh, eventually, that culminates, of course, in glaciation. And what we see in the horse um, fossil record seems to kind of match those environmental changes. So we have animals that have these browsing teeth transitioning to animals that had grazing teeth as the grasslands spread. <clears throat> We have uh, e even the increase in size. You know, you could see that as a response to uh, a cooling environment. Um, that the the single hoof is is well designed for moving around on sort of hard, dry grasslands rather than sort of m maybe more sort of wetter, marshier, sort of forested environments. So, so the the changes that we see in the horse series kind of make sense when you think about what was happening to the world after the flood as it cooled and and dried dried out so. sure so there's a consistent story there and uh although like you say it's kind of radical maybe that's a maybe that's a tough pill for some creationists to swallow actually it's all of a piece with what we're seeing in other groups right that the created kind is probably somewhere often for vertebrates around the family level and that's you know all of these creatures that we're talking about all members of a single biological family the equity um and so it sort of makes sense that what we're seeing is diversification within a single created kind so guys we've we've kind of gotten into the weeds a little bit here we i wonder if i might back us out and kind of take a view from forty thousand feet and just help people locate the horses amongst the other mammals yeah yeah so um so there's this large group of mammals that we call the ungulates. These are the, the hooved mammals. And they sort of come in maybe two, traditionally in taxonomy, two major flavors. You've got the uh, even-toed ungulates, the order Artiodactyla, with commonly <laughs> four or two toes. And this is things like cattle, pigs, giraffes, camels, sheep, deer, hippopotamuses. And then you've got the other flavor, which are the odd-toed ungulates, or the order Parisodactyla, um, commonly with three toes. Uh, modern horses obviously have one toe or one hoof. Uh, the tapirs, uh, interestingly, have uh, four toes on their front, front legs. And we find all of those conditions, you know, the three-toe, three-toe, front and back, um, the four on the front, front, three on the back in the horse fossil series as well. Um, and then, so this is the order Parisodactyla, like I've said. And there are two major suborders, although not everyone calls them suborders, but definitely there's this group called the Tapiromorphs, and these are the rhinos and the tapirs and things like them. And then there's the suborder Hippomorph, or Hippomorpha, or the Hippomorphs. And there's also this thing floating out there called the equoidea. Some people put that equal to hippomorpha. 
Some people have it as a super family underneath the hippomorpha. But this is the horsids in the family equity. This is the paleotheres. And, you know, guys, there are a few things out there that some people call paleotheres. Some people call them sister or basal to the paleotheres. Things like Hollenzia, uh, true hyracotherium, leporinum, and even this thing called propachinolophus. So there's these sort of three major genera hanging out there that may not be paleotheres. They're probably not equids, but they're part of this superfamily uh, equidia. Um, so the, equi the equids then are part of this superfamily equidia. Uh, as a family themselves, 35 plus genera, again, mostly these um, fossil forms in the Cenozoic sediments. Uh, you know, there's, the old adage is if you ask 10 taxonomists to describe anything, you're going to get 10 different answers. So some, like McFadden in his classic book about horses, has three equid subfamilies, um, right. the Hyracotherini, the Archithereini, and the Equini. And of course, those groups kind of came out and were sort of noticeable in that original uh, baromenology study in 2003. Mm. Yeah, so that's sort of a little bit of a, a view from 40,000 feet to help us locate the horses amongst the other mammals. So let me emphasize something there. When you went through that, um, I hope listeners and audience members are recognizing here. What is the the closest, if you're, if you're macroevolutionary, you know, if you believe in macroevolution, what is the closest living relative to a horse? Well... It's rhinos, the rhinos and, and tapirs, yeah. tapirs, right? So yeah. they're nothing like horses, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I can look at a dog and a bear and I can tell the difference between a dog and a bear, but they sure do look an awful lot alike. Um, but when it comes to horses, there's just nothing out there that's like a horse. It's quite distinct. Right. Um, so you would think it would be pretty easy to say horses are their own created kind. Um, <laughs> And as I mentioned, this has been something of a hard pill for some folks to swallow. Um, and we didn't get a lot of resistance right away. I think most people just had no idea what we were talking about. That, that, <laughs> the title of that paper was horrible. And I think it was done on purpose. Um, and uh, I think it's quite descriptive, actually. When I look at it, I know exactly what you're trying to say. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. <laughs> So we did get some criticism um, later on um, from people who wanted to say, no, that there, this is obviously multiple created kinds. And there are these weird creatures um, like the paleotheres that have been put forward as sort of the evolutionary you know, relatives or the evolutionary predecessors of the horses. So if, if, if we said it was a created kind back in 2003, what more is there to say? guys why would we need to go on well shall i take the story up there because um sure kind of what what i then tried to do and this was in uh well i made the first attempt in 2004 and then i tried it again in 2016 was to do a similar analysis but to include some non-horses some of these paleotheres and some of these other in evolutionary terms closely related fossil taxa and what I wanted to try and see if I could do was to detect a discontinuity, separation, if you like, between the horses and the non-horses. So back in 2004, I, I had a data set that had 13 uh, fossil taxa. There were 10 perissodactyls, um, including some horses and non-horses. And then there were a couple of non-perissodactyls. So they were really kind of you know, outside the group. There are some things called phenacodonts and basically what i found was that these things sorted out into four clusters but only the phenacodonts were negatively correlated with the other groups so it was all very inconclusive i couldn't really um you know make any strong conclusions from it uh, other than 
the Fanacodonts were different to everything else. That was right. that was basically uh, what I found, and it kind of wasn't a surprise in the sense that the data set was basically all teeth. Um, you know, the, the, so I'm not sampling, you know, a, a nice cross section of character traits. So I'm I'm only looking at teeth because that's what's available for for many of these these taxa. So that was 2004. 2016, I, I took another data set, which had been published in 2013. Uh, that was 26 uh, fossil taxa, including a couple of horses, along with some paleotheres and some other non-horses. And uh, again, I did a similar analysis. Uh, it looked to me in the results as if there was a, there was a cluster of taxa, which included the horses, and that that cluster was separated by discontinuity from some of the other non-horses um, including the paleotheres which we've mentioned and that genus that tim mentioned uh, pachynolophus uh, so there is clearly some discontinuity or it seemed to me there was some discontinuity there but again um the results were were a bit unsatisfactory uh, again i'm i'm dealing only with teeth um so it's not very holistic, and it was it wasn't easy to to make a strong conclusion. So that's kind of where where things you know were left. Uh, I I had two good stabs at it um, using data sets that I had available, and um, yeah, it was difficult to draw any any firm conclusions from it. And then I think that's really where kind of Tim's work has come in now. So Tim, why don't you give us a, a rundown of what you did so far? Sure. So, you know, I, I'm a trained taxonomist and I've done conventional taxonomy on salamanders and turtles. And I got invited to one of the first baromenology study group meetings in 1999. And I've just been in love with it ever since. And I've, you know, done baromenology on various things through the years. So at uh, origins at the origins 2021 meeting todd said hey why don't you guys at liberty uh take a stab at the horses and with my newfound freedom of not preaching every sunday i <laughs> recruited four students and we got busy and we the first thing we did was we uh entered you know digitized maybe 20 different data sets and we recoded them so that they could be used with some of the new methods and then we kind of sorted and said, which, you know, what do we want to do? Which of these data sets actually has a potential to show discontinuity? And of course, that would mean that there were outgroups included, you know, with the horses. So what we, what we, our study sort of had two major parts, and I struggled to whether I should submit one or two abstracts to origins. We decided to just do one. But the first thing we wanted to do was to look at those three studies that you all just described, the three original horse baromenology studies. And we wanted to apply some of the new methods that have come in the last year or so. So we wanted to see what it would, what it would do to, to include Spearman correlations and Jacquard distances. What do Pam and Fanny look like and how do they compare to what had been found in sort of the first gen methods and essentially it, it confirmed what you all had found. So Paul, it confirmed that you weren't able to say very much. It confirmed <laughs> uh, the original study that it seems like they're a mono baramin. Uh, we, we sort of recovered that same stratomorphic series using some of the new methods. So, you know, it was sort of like, yeah, what, what has been said already, we can confirm that um, with this new look using new methods. But then we also uh, analyzed two new data sets, uh, Froelich 2002, which I think, Paul, is sort of related to that Danilo one that you looked mm. at, but a little bit different. And then this newer one by Rose et al. in, uh, I believe it's 2014. And um, both, at least one of them, I think the Rose claims to have some postcranial characteristics and as well dental cranial post cranial so that's an improvement plus lots of outgroups and rose at all especially has like it includes like um opossums it's got a lot some things that are really really oh, no. far out groups <laughs> and then coming down to the close ones 
as well. So it's got perissodactyls, non-perissodactyls. So there's plenty of you know near and far out groups in both of them. And basically what we've been finding, we've not complete, completed all the analyses yet, but we've, we've done some preliminary ones, is that the horses are grouping together like, like you had found in some of your work, Paul, that they're, they're grouping together. Now, sometimes they're grouping with some of those non-equid equoids. Hmm. And let's just face it, that's just fun to say, non-equid equoids. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's those weird things like Alenzia, Propachinolophus, the paleothere. Sometimes we can't shake them out of this horse or equid group. And then... The horses, especially when we start using subsets of the data, the horses are showing discontinuity with non perissodactyls They're showing discontinuity with other perissodactyls If we just reduce it down to say like horses and to pyromorphs, there's discontinuity there in both data sets. Um, but like I said, the one thing that maybe is not puzzling, but the one thing we keep seeing is that some of these other non-equid equoids are, are clustering with the horses as well. So, so yeah, so that's, that's what we had presented at Origins 2022. Uh, we have um, submitted uh, a proposal for, for ICC in 2023 uh, as a full-length paper well, where we'll be able to explore this more. We're currently running new analyses to make sure we round this thing out. Um, I don't think we'll have a, a, an additional data set of the ones that we have. Those two look to be the most promising um, mm -hmm. in terms of being able to detect this continuity. And preliminarily, I would say we're, we're, we've detected more discontinuity than has been detected in the past. Whether or not in the end, Paul will be able to say this is a whole of a or not is another thing. Oh, and by the way, um, my, one of my students, Jack Gregory, who's been the most involved, he'll be a part of that paper. And um, we were very wise, I think, to also invite Paul um, because of his past experience and just knowledge of vertebrate paleontology in general to bring him on the team and, and help uh, keep us straight. Um, so, so we're excited about that, the new analyses and you know, I think, Paul, we won't know until everything's been run and we all sort of look at it and say, what can we conclude from this? How far can we go? Can we use the H yeah. word and say whole of a ramen or just say <laughs> potential uh, discontinuity? Yeah. 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 All right. So well, for, for those for the, for those who might not know what ICC is, by the way, that's the International Conference on Creationism. And I, I you know, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, the final results from these analyses, because it kind of raises this question, whether some of those non equid equoids are actually part of the same created kind. Right. Or or could it just be that, you know, our data isn't good enough at the moment to separate them out. So, you know, we talk about we've, controversy, we've got, right? Yeah, so we, we we but we've got but we're dealing with very fragmentary fossil material often, and uh, and and that's always a confounding factor when you're trying to draw these kinds of conclusions. Yeah. So we we we've, we've we've got to make our conclusions tentative. We can only go as far as the data can allow us to go. Right. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, as the years have gone by and my experience in barominology has grown, I have only I have only become more and more skeptical. <laughs> about our initial horse study that we published in 2003 um sometimes i get the sense that our critics think that we're that we're um you know making these inerrant proclamations and that i almost bow down to what we say but mm -mm, no that is the opposite of what i feel especially with the horses like you say paul the, some of these things are fragmentary much of what we've done has been on teeth which you know, you can't tell created kinds from teeth. And um, and I think, you know, honestly, I think the jury's kind of still out on whether the horse series should be considered a single created kind or whether it should be broken up. I'm not sure. Now, uh, one thing that surprised me about the original study, the 2003 study, when I dug into it, is that you guys had coded it differently than how it's coded now. 
you had missing values coded as zeros, yeah. which of course the algorithm treats zeros as if they're similarities. Yes. And so I got to thinking, I was like, and you can edit this out if you need to. I got to thinking, <laughs> wow, if they would have coded it the way we coded it today, they would have had nothing. There was basically one point of continuity connecting the subgroups of horses. <laughs> um, now, the good news is that the new methods that we applied, especially when you start moving into Jacquard and Spearman, whatever you start thinking about that, it sort of rescued the whole thing. And the Jacquard Spearman diagram actually looks a lot like the original one that you guys had done, but we sort of coded it in a modern way with missing values as question marks and zeros as only if a characteristic was truly absent. So right. some of the newer methods actually look really good in terms of confirming what you all had said about stratomorphic series, monobaramin, et cetera. Yeah. So. yeah, like I said, this was this was the wild blue yonder days of uh, the new <laughs> frontier, right? Uh, and so we were we were sort of still making it up as we went back then. And yeah, things have changed now. And so, yeah, it's important to understand that science progresses, right? It's not it's not a settled thing. The fact that you read in the paper or you read in your news feed that, you know, there's been a new discovery that's caused scientists to rethink everything they thought about, whatever. Sometimes that's exaggeration. We don't rethink everything we thought we knew. But a lot of the times it's legit because we do make new discoveries that really make us sort of re rethink what we used to think about these things. And that's just how science works. So I, for one, am really happy to see uh, new work being done on the horses. I'm hoping we'll get some firmer answers this time that we'll be able to um, either say, you know, this is one created kind or not, you know, one or the other so well thank you dr brophy for being thank with you. us thanks for inviting me we appreciate your sharing your time um, absolutely and to all of you who are listening please do visit us uh on the web at coreside.org slash podcast uh, if you would like to uh, interact with us you can check us out on our social media pages we're on all the major ones facebook instagram and twitter um, you could also send us an email, podcast at coresci.org, and that is C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot O-R-G. Uh, Let's Talk Creation is sponsored by um, Biblical Creation Trust in part. Paula, why don't you tell us about BCT? Yep, uh, you can check us out at our website, which is biblicalcreationtrust.org. Um, we're also active on Facebook. You can find our Facebook page and on our website, if you'd like to make a donation to the work of uh, BCT and help us keep all of this good content coming, uh, there's a donate button and that will just take you to all of the options so that you can you know, make a donation, whether that's by PayPal or a direct bank transfer or whatever it is. So we, we do appreciate all your help and support. And for those of you listening in the United States, uh, if you want to check out the other co-sponsor of the podcast, Core Academy of Science, we are at coresci.org slash connect that's where you'll find links to important content that we would like you to read and learn about our ministry uh, you can also check out coresci.org slash donate to make a financial contribution to keep this podcast going paul our next episode i think we're going to do something kind of kooky and fun we'll just be um looking at reader questions we we recently turned on the comments on youtube and there's been a whole bunch of them so so we're just going to go through a bunch and interact with them for for the next episode so that should be crazy yeah. so that'll be fun yeah so <laughs> we will uh see all of you back again in two weeks for the next episode of let's talk creation thanks for listening to this week's episode of let's talk creation if you have questions, send them to podcast at coresci.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you.